Okay, let's get ready for the last session today. Great that so many people are still here before the beer. I, th I see some already have beer, that's also good. My name is Kai from Confluent and I want to give you an introduction today about KSQL, the open source streaming SQL engine for Apache Kafka. Before I start, who of you knows Apache Kafka or is using it already? So that's almost everybody. That's good for this session, that's great. So this session is around 20 minutes um, of presentation and then I will give 15 minutes um, live demo so that you really get a feeling about what KSQL is and how easy it is to use. So first of all, most of you know Apache Kafka already, but let's take a little bit of a look at the history. So Kafka is already many, many years old and uh, around four years ago Confluent was founded, which is more or less the company behind Apache Kafka. And then uh, Kafka Connect and Kafka Streams were introduced as part of the Apache Kafka framework. And now, um, around half a year ago, um, we G8 KSQL. So it was announced around one year ago, and since half a year already it's available as GA, so really ready for production. And that's a good reason today at Big Data Spain to talk a little bit about it. And so you see the different use cases, when to use it, and when maybe not to use it. So that's the main idea of this talk. Here you see um, what KSQL is or what part of Apache Kafka ecosystem it is. So Kafka um, is not just a messaging layer, it's much, much more. Um, as I said uh, for a minute ago, Kafka in the middle, it's the brokers. So you produce messages and consume messages in a scalable way. And then you have Kafka Connect for integration, as you see here, for example, MySQL integration as source or Elasticsearch as Think. And then you have Kafka Streams for stream processing natively on Kafka. So that's what the Apache Kafka framework is. And now we also have KSQL, which is one of many Confluent open source components, which is on top optional as additional tool for Apache Kafka. And as you see here, um, it's not an accident that it's on top of Kafka Streams, but it's based on Kafka Streams. So that's the main, main goal. The engine under the hood, in the end, it's Kafka Streams. But as, but as user of KSQL, you don't see that. So why did we build KSQL even though there is Kafka Streams? Kafka Streams is built for core developers. So if you're a Java developer or on the Java platform with Scala or something like this, then you can write stream processing applications on top of Apache Kafka without any additional tooling like Spark or Flink or Storm. You can do that all just with the Apache Kafka cluster and do things like aggregations, filtering, transformations, and all the use cases you have for stream processing. However, um, that's still too complex for many other users. So either if you're not a Java developer, so let's say you want to write Python code or .NET or something else, or maybe you're not really a core developer, but more like a data engineer, which does data processing, filtering, enrichment. Maybe you're even a data scientist, which does these kind of things. Um, then KSQL is the real tool for you now, because it's not Java coding, it's much easier to use, as you will see but you can leverage the same benefits under the hood, like scalability, high throughput, and so on. So just to be clear here, KSQL still, it's not for BI analysts. So you still have to be able to write things like SQL code. So it's not for a business user. You have to be a technical person or technical understanding to use KSQL. But you see here, um, it's really a different expanded realm of who can now access Apache Kafka and process the data. Here we see it from another perspective. Um, at the bottom you see Apache Kafka, that's the core brokers. And on top of that you write your clients. And this now can be, for example, the Java consumer and producer API. This is relatively low level. You are very flexible here, you can do whatever you want, but you have to write a lot of code. That is why Kafka Streams was introduced um, two or three years ago for stream processing. It's a wrapper around the producers and consumers with a lot of added functionality so that you can build stream processing much easier on top of Kafka with, with this wrapper and, and framework. And now on top of that, we have one more tool. We have KSQL, which leverages, leverages Kafka and Kafka Streams under the hood but so that you can build stream processing applications just with writing SQL-like queries. And that's in the end what I want to show now, uh, now show you in much more detail. So before I go really into the technology and the concepts and how that works and the architecture behind that, I really start with different use cases so that you understand when KSQL might be the right choice for you. It's always this 80-20 rule. So KSQL will not be for every use case, but for some use cases it will be much, much easier for you. Even if you are a Java developer, you should think about isn't KSQL a much better solution for specific problems? 
So here's the first example. Um, KSQL can be used for data exploration, exploration and debugging. So even if you don't want to use Kafka Streams or build stream processing applications, so if you just have an ingestion layer where you send data, for example, from MySQL to Elasticsearch or whatever, um, you can just use KSQL for debugging and exploration of the data. So for example, there's a show topics command. I will show that all that in the live demo also to analyze the stream data, the, uh, the, the content of the data. Um, or you can do simple select queries to debug existing data flows. So if you have um, a big scale deployment and want to take a look into that in real time, in the real world example, you can just select and query maybe for only your test user and uh, have a continuous stream of that data. So as you see here in the examples, it's really simple to use. And if you t spend 20 minutes with it, I'm, I'm sure you can use it on your own Kafka cluster already with your topics and with your logic. However, you can do much, much more than just this kind of debugging and analysis. That's just, just really the first step. Another example um, is transformation. So there, this is still um, relatively simple stuff, but very important. So you often have to do things for your existing Kafka cluster, like changing the number of partitions. Because in the beginning of your project, often you don't know that later you need more partitions, then you have to change this. Or sometimes you have to convert your data. Let's say all your incoming data is JSON, but you decide in the future you will use Afro instead, or some other technology. Then you can convert this. Or you have to repartition the data. That's also things which happen in Kafka from time to time for different reasons. That's in the past what you did with command line tools or with coding in Java. Here you just write SQL queries for that. This is one example. You can use that on your data for doing data transformations on the existing topics and Kafka infrastructure. However, that still, you can do much, much more. So that was just examples what you can do very easily. But what actually KSQL was built for is really streaming pr continuous processing of data. So even though um, this is just SQL queries, you can deploy them to production and scale them up and down. And it's used, usable for hundreds of millions of messages and hundreds of nodes. So it's the same story like for Kafka Streams or for any other Kafka client. Even though you just write a SQL command here. And here is one example um, where we do this kind of streaming ATL, where we filter and only want to get our Platinum users in this case. So this query is written once, and then it's deployed, and then it's con uh, running continuously forever until you stop the query. So it's not just like with an Oracle database, where you do a request-response-like query in SQL. That's very different. So here is um, one example for doing some kind of streaming ETL. So um, here we again have a MySQL database as one example. We use Kafka Connect to do the integration also based on Kafka. The huge advantage of Kafka Connect is that you don't need another integration layer, like an ETL or ESB tool or any other ingestion layer, because then you have to manage two clusters and guarantee that the data is delivered without data loss and replication and all these things which can go wrong. Kafka Connect, like Kafka Streams and KSQL, natively run on top of Kafka. So you just have to manage one big cluster in the middle to, to run all that. And then with KSQL here in the middle, you process the data, and then you get the data into Elasticsearch. In this case, again, with Kafka Connect, but this could be any other Kafka consumer. So that doesn't matter. This is just in this example here to show you one example from change data capture, so pushing data out of the database, processing it with KSQL on Kafka, and then sending it to a sync, in this case, Elasticsearch. So it's all natively Kafka stuff, like you know it before, just that you use KSQL now for processing instead of any other kind of application. So you can do more with KSQL. So for example, um, you can also do things like um, real-time enrichment, and that means you can do joins and powerful aggregations. So um, you can, for example, either do stream table joins or stream stream joins. I will talk about these concepts more in, in some minutes. But the main idea is really that you can combine different streams and join them. So you know that from an Oracle database with SQL, you do different joins of different um, tables. Um, one thing to understand, of course, you cannot do um, a join with many, many different topics in one query. So it's not this kind of uh, index query where you can do very complex things. It's really for joining different streams together to process the data continuously. That's the main use case here. 
Here is one example for that. So in this case, um, for a retailing example, we have a stream of sales data um, from online and offline stores, which is fed into Kafka. And on the other side, we have another information about shipments that arrive. That's also real-time streaming data in this case. And then with KSQL, you can join this data and process it in real time. So depending on your use case, you can just join it or then do things like filtering, aggregations, transformations. All of that can be done with one or more KSQL processes before it is then, then sent, in this case, into my SQL database. But here again, that's just one example. Any other Kafka consumer could also get this data. The point is that you can do this join at scale and you can deploy it like any other Kafka application. And that's the huge advantage here by just writing SQL queries. You can do many powerful things at scale with the same reliability as any other Kafka client. So another use case is real-time monitoring. So that's pretty easy to do with KSQL. So here we see one IoT example where we integrate with sensor information, which can again come from anywhere via Kafka Connect or any other Kafka application. And then um, you write one query. In this case, we do a count. And we do a count with a um, tumbling window with size of one minute to analyze um, if we have a count of bigger than five. And in this case, it's an error. And then we can send this error to another system. It can be a real-time dashboard, it can be the mobile app of the operator, it can be anything. Any other Kafka consumer can again consume this information, which we get out of this KSQL query. So this is another powerful example. Here is a, here's a, a use case for that, connected cars. We see that really a lot in, in, in projects. And um, you can either combine different sensors, for example, from different cars or different devices, or like in this example, um, the streaming data, like the cars, which is millions of events per second, and combine that with more static data, like MySQL again. So for example, you might have a customer database in a MySQL storage, and this um, also has uh, data which changes, but not that often, and in this case, therefore, you combine the stream of the car sensors together with the table information of the, of the database table. Both are injected into Kafka in real time and then aggregated and combined by a KSQL query. So um, it can be different scale, as you see here. The sensors are large scale and combined and joined with low scale of MySQL. And then again, it's fed into another system. In this case, we use a custom Kafka Streams application. So again, I repeat it again and again because it's so important. You can use any Kafka consumer here again after you have processed the data with KSQL on top of Kafka. So the last use case I have, this is anomaly detection. This is another good example. Um, this is also very powerful with simple examples. So this is Hello World here, of course, but you can do more powerful things. But here in this example, I think you understand well how that works. In this case, we aggregate data and use 30 second uh, windows. So in this case, we want to say we get all payments, the card number for a credit card and count it. And if within 30 seconds in this example, we have three or more payments by this credit card number, then we send an alert to another system. So this is a very simple example, right? But this shows you how you can build even more powerful, stateful queries with, uh, with KSQL. So it's not just about streaming ETL or so, that's one use case, where you filter just one incoming message and transform it and send it to the next um, output. You can also aggregate data and build stateful applications like here. So here's one more example, and this is actually really now a little bit more complex one. I've also shared um, here the GitHub link where I have the implementation. In this example, um, we do um, sensor analytics, and in this case, I've built a user-defined function. So while KSQL has many functions out of the box for summarizing things or aggregation or filter, you can build your own um, user-defined function easily. In this case, I've built a pretty ex a powerful one. So I have trained an analytic model with TensorFlow before using um, Google Cloud and, and um, autoencoders in this case. The technology doesn't matter here. You can use that with anything. The point is I have embedded embedded uh, analytic model built with some machine learning framework and embedded it into this function here. And when now the end user, which doesn't know what machine learning is or how you program that, he just uses this function here and applies the analytic model to the streaming data. So here we have one stream where we do anomaly detection. We get the sensor ID from the car and apply 
the user defined function to the sensor value, which in this case is some engine sensors about temperature. And the analytic model under the hood in real time does the predictions so that we find anomalies, where again we can send alerts to an emergency system, for example, or send all the information to an elastic search like here to analyze it later, both for the, for the, for the alarms and for the non-alarms. So this was now a lot about use cases. Let's now also talk a little bit more about how to build that. Because that's also a, a key difference to many other of these um, stream processing frameworks. KSQL, the same like Kafka Streams, um, it's pretty lightweight and simple. It's a small application which you build. You can build more instances of that and scale it up and down dynamically at runtime without data loss and replication and all the things you know from Kafka. But the point is, it's small, lightweight applications or microservices. So in contrary to un other big data frameworks like Spark Streaming or Flink or Storm, you don't deploy all these applications in the one big data cluster, where you ha then have to handle things like scheduling and resource allocation and all these things. In this case, you build your use case independently of the other projects and teams and deploy and manage it like you want. So you can do A-B testing with your application, you can uh, deploy a new version, do whatever you want, it's completely independent of all the other applications. So not all of these have to be KSQL applications. You use whatever you want, KSQL, Kafka Streams, .NET, however you build your application. But they're all independent here, that's very important. And that's also true for deployment then. So as it's just a small, lightweight Java process in the end running, you can run it anywhere. And one of these projects we just saw could maybe use just Java processes, running them on bare metal. And the other one is much more modern with cutting edge technologies and deploys it in Kubernetes or in the cloud to scale it up and down dynamically. All right? So every KSQL application like Kafka Streams can be deployed like you want it, independently of all the others. That's the huge advantage of that. So let's talk a little bit more about the concepts behind KSQL. And, and that's really the main point why we build it. So you don't have to think about all the low-level details of Kafka. Right? That's the point. You write SQL queries. And you don't have to think about the serialization and deserialization and the generics and lambdas. All these things which Java developers love, but some others don't. And so for many things, it's much easier without thinking about this. However, and that's really very, very important, you can still leverage all the features of Apache Kafka and Kafka Streams. So from Kafka, you like know things like um, it's a distributed system for high volume, fault tolerance, scalability. All that is built into KSQL under the hood. And also all the Kafka Streams features, like the windowing for aggregations, the event time aggregation, late arriving data, and even things like exactly one semantics, which were introduced into Kafka with 0.11, so around one and a half years ago, I think. All these features are also available for KSQL, even though you just write the SQL queries as end user. That's all implemented under the hood by the runtime. And with that, it's no surprise, really, so um, KSQL is also equally viable for any kind of use case then. So while I on my live demo in a minute, I will just use my laptop and have one single instance, you can then deploy that to production and scale it up and down. Maybe to a few instances or maybe really in a big deployment. So it scales like any other Kafka application. Under the hood, you just have to think about things like partitioning. So you use enough partitions that you can scale it to enough consumers, for example. But that's the same um, things you have to think about for any Kafka application. But having that in mind, you can scale it up and down like any other Kafka application. And it's really it's production ready. It's GA for half a year already. So you can run it and we mean it for really mission critical systems without any downtime and these kind of things. So it's fault tolerant, so it's powered by Kafka. So just one example here to, to really explain it in detail. Um, here we see um, three instances running of KSQL. And now if one instance fails, then that's totally OK. That's like Kafka. So you have now two instances. Under the hood, you have to do things like rebalancing and migrating some data and stuff. That's built in into the Kafka protocol. So that's not what you have to care about. And it's the same for KSQL like for any other Kafka application here. And then when you start either the same application or you have another application which you start in another instance, maybe in another Docker container, then it rebalances again and uses again all the three instances of KSQL. So it scales in the same way like any other Kafka application. 
One important concept, um, I want to mention it again, and I will also show it in the live demo. Um, that's the same like for Kafka streams. KSQL has the concepts of streams and tables, and that's very, very important, especially if you want to also build stateful applications and maybe even store information longer in such an application. So maybe not just for minutes, but you can also store it for hours or days, depending on what your use case is. So the stream is, as you see on the left side, um, that's a stream like you know it, one event is one action. So you have Alice 1, you have Charlie 1, you have Alice 2, Bob 1. Every event is, is by itself, like in the Kafka log, right? Everything is one message. And so you don't lose this data because it's one single event each. And if you use patterns like event sourcing or so, you can start from the beginning and get every event and process it. On the other side, the table, that's more like what you know from an uh, Oracle MySQL database. This one updates the information, like in a Kafka compacted topic, so you only get the most updated information. It's still a stream, so it's always continuously updated, but when you do want to consume that, you always only get the most recent information for each of the users. So in the, in the last uh, time example here, you only get LS2, and LS1 is already removed here. So use streams or tables like you need them. Um, if you want to store data longer, then tables are often a better choice here. And both are natively built into KSQL like in Kafka Stream, so um, you can choose them. It's a very similar syntax, and you just have to decide what to do. You can do joins with both directions, so you can either do stream table joins then also, or maybe also stream stream joins. That was not possible in the beginning if you follow KSQL for some time, but it's in the meantime already available also. Um, you have options for windowing, so um, one important thing here is um, KSQL is not ANSI SQL, right? That doesn't make any sense for a stream processing application because we actually want to build continuous queries which run long term in your system to continuously process data. And therefore you have additional options, for example here you see tumbling windows, hopping windows, session windows. That's in the end to build the different use cases. But it's pretty easy to use, just take a look at the documentation and build um, your application with your windows you need. From an architecture perspective, KSQL has three key components, the engine, the REST interface, and the command line interface. And however, very important, and that's something what new users of KSQL are not aware of at the beginning, so you need this in addition to the Kafka cluster. So data is not processed on the Kafka cluster, on the brokers, on the zookeepers, that's independent of that. It's just another client for the Kafka brokers in the end. That's very important to understand to be clear what it is. So you can ca use KSQL from everywhere, and that's one of the reasons why in the beginning I explained the motivation for why we built it. So you can either use a web UI, so we in our um, control center, for example, have a, a development UI where you have things like code completion and other features which are pretty fancy. Um, you can use the command line interface in your terminal, like I will do in a minute in my live demo. You can use the REST interface, and from that you can do anything. You can do a curl command, but you can also integrate it somewhere. In this example, I've integrated it into a Python notebook. So you can write Python code, and from there, you can get the streaming data. And you can create new queries, you can select it, you can do filtering, transformations, all of that. And, and that's in this example for data scientists or data engineers perfect. They want to use Jupyter, they want to use Python, and still you can access Kafka, and then also if you you can just use it interactively for trying it out and analyzing data, or you can also later deploy the same query to production afterwards. And that's in the end what's happening in the last mode. This is the headless mode. This means, um, first of all, you write your new queries and learn what to do and understand and build your query. And then when you have your query which is running, then you deploy it in headless mode. That means simply you deploy it into production on a KSQL server. There you typically don't want to change it. Either you kill it and, start and deploy a new instance, but there it's running continuously because it's meant for production at scale. Here you see the two different examples. So on top we have the Kafka cluster. This is the Kafka brokers and zookeepers, what you ha have as mandatory before you start with KSQL. And then we have um, the KSQL instances. KSQL, like Kafka streams, it's in the end Java. So here you have KSQL servers, which are Java processes running somewhere. And somewhere is really anywhere. It's a Docker container, it's bare metal, it's the cloud. That's your choice, because it's just Java processes. And then you have the interface, how you connect to that, and that is in this case in interactive mode. It's the command line interface or any REST client or web UI, where you um, inject your queries into the servers. And then on the other side, we have the headless mode, that's the production mode. If we want to deploy it, we just add the SQL um, command to a file and deploy it into the SQL server. So that's the two different options you need for development and testing and debugging, and then also if you want to deploy it to production. 
Um, there are then several architectural uh, challenges which you have to understand. So um, typically you don't build one big KSQL cluster with hundreds of instances. So for example, like in this, you can to, uh, create two dedicated clusters, um, one in this case for some finance KSQL queries and another one for sales queries. So this is th then some best practices and depends on the use cases. Do you want to write, uh, create one cluster for each query or specific queries into one cluster? That's then detailed questions. We have some best practices on our website for that. But that's then really more uh, deep dive questions and discussions. But uh, you have to be aware it's possible and, and you have to think about that, like for any other Kafka application. The last point before I come to a live demo, um, I mentioned it before for my um, machine learning demo, so you can also easily build user-defined functions, um, both for stateless and for stateful aggregated use cases. So that's the UDF or the UDAF. And here you see just one screenshot. Um, in the end, it's just one class of Java code which you, sh which you write. It's one or two methods you have to implement. And here is your custom logic. In my example, I simply I trained a TensorFlow model, uh, an analytic model, then some binary code, and I directly embedded it here. But you can do anything. It's just code. You could also do um, anything what you have in, uh, in mind. You can embed any library here, do remote calls if that makes sense for your use case, or whatever it is. So today, you have to do that in Java. In the future, we will also offer um, UDFs from other languages, so that even Python or Go users can write their UDFs in their language. Today, you have to use the Java code. With that, um, let's take a look at how that looks live. So um, I have to switch my screen. I hope that also works. Takes some seconds, usually. And it's really tough for me to type, as you see here, how I'm standing. So. Um, it's not the easiest way, but now we see we see the screen. Is that good enough? Yes, that's good. Okay, so what you see here, um, I have already started um, my local um, development environment. I used the command line interface from Confluent. It's an open source tool for development. With one command, you can start all the components and shut it down later and all these things. So I just uh, typed um, Confluent start uh, KSQL server and it started for me all the dependencies, including Zookeeper and Kafka. And so now in the end we have one um, local development environment and I hear really, um, you see, I, I, it's really hard for me to type so I will just use from my GitHub example and copy paste um, the code. Um, so we have already started the KSQL server. So now um, we also have um, some test generator uh, data which we use. This by the way is also available on GitHub so even if you are not using KSQL you can use this uh, test generator to easily configure your own data which you want to generate for your use cases. And I have two examples. Um, this use case, which I show here, is clickstream data. So I have user data and I have clickstreams for that. And now I start um, the KSQL command line interface. As I said, in this case, um, I use the command line interface. The same could be done in a web UI or from Python or whatever. So here is my command line interface. It's really pretty easy to use. And you can also do basic things like list topics, for example. So in this case, um, we see now the Kafka topics, right? So in this case, we have page views and users. That's the two topics um, we, will, we will use to process data. So um, first of all, another example, you can also do things like printing here, if you just want to see some data here. So it's, it's e very easy also for doing, for doing things like debugging your existing infrastructure, even if you don't want to build stream processing applications. But we want to do that now, and for that we build one first stream, as you see here, I always type clear so that it's on top and easier for you to read. So we create one stream, in this case page views original, with some attributes here from the click stream. And here you see this is related now to one Kafka topic, page views. So this is a stream I have to create first, and then in this case its value format is delimited, and um, so comma separated data. And then um, we can take a look at the streams. In this case, it's pretty simple. We have just one stream here. And we can describe the stream so that we can see um, the architecture of that, uh, the, the, the schema of that. And with that then, uh, here we are. Here we can now um, write the queries. And that's the SQL queries we write. First of all, I select from Patriots original. And here you see the main goal of KSQL actually is continuous queries. So this is never stopping now until I put uh, in control C. It's continuous queries because afterwards you want to deploy them to production at scale for processing millions of messages, right? So I have to stop it here. Um, the other option is, this was the um, page views data. We can also take a look at the um, page views original. And here in this case, I select the page and the user ID. And here you see, now I simply said limit 10. In this case, you can do interactive analysis where it automatically stops after the limit you have, you have reached. So um, 
from that, um, I will also create a table. Again, the, the basic difference is that a table only stores the most recent value. So here we create a, ra uh, a table for the user data. Here it makes sense because also user data often you only want to have the most uh, recent data about the address or email or phone or whatever. Here you see the format is JSON now, so it supports different formats also. And now after we have the table, we could also show or describe that. I will skip this part. Um, and then, um, what's more interesting, maybe I will also create a join here as one example. So first of all, I create female users. So this is like you would expect it from normal SQL. You now create from the user's original um, another table, which is only the female users. And from this, um, I can again maybe print or, or use a select query. Here you see now it prints the data of that, which is JSON in this case. And then um, now I do a join. So in this case, we see here um, I created a join. This is a join from page with original, left join to user's original. You also see here are different join options, how you want to combine that. That's pretty similar to SQL, so to ANSI SQL. And then um, in this case, we only want again the users which are gender female. And now, um, as we have created this join, which is a continuous join, continuously running, um, we can run it here. So um, here we see I limited it to three, but if I um, remove the limit, then this is again a continuous query which is running. And in this way, you see how powerful it is because after testing it, you can deploy that to production and scale it up and down to different instances. On my laptop, it's always only one instance because it's just to, to demoing it to you. And the last very interesting part which I want to show is the Afro support. Um, if you don't know that, um, or maybe many use it, so Kafka has, has heavy and very good Afro support, which has a lot of advantages. Um, for example, the Confluent Schema Registry uses Afro, so that you can really enforce the schemas, including um, schema evolution and all these things. And for KSQL, it's even more interesting. So let me just first create um, another test stream. So in addition to my delimited and JSON data, I now also create um, Afro data. And with that, um, we can first again do a print, for example, to take a look, but we see it here already anyway. Um, let's do a print of the data. So here you see this is now data in, in Afro format, which is under the hood here, JSON data. And um, now we create another stream, and now um, here's one important difference. So before, and in the other streams which I created, I had to add the structure here, right? I, for the user data, I had to add the, the name and the ID and integer and string and all these things. Because here we use Afro, um, for Afro, it already knows what structure it is. So I can create the stream ratings here from the stream topic, uh, from, the, from the ratings topic, and I say value Afro format, and here it already knows the structure. So if you take a look at this, and um, say describe ratings. So you see here, um, it knows the structure in KSQL because it's Afro, so it's a huge advantage or makes it much easier to use Afro if that's possible. And now here, um, and that's no surprise, even so in KSQL we didn't define the structure here, we can now do select queries here. So remember, the create stream here was without any structure, but based on that now we can, um, this was a wrong to copy paste, we can um, select the data here, right? Um, for example, from ratings, or then we can also do things like um, just with an attribute where stars um, is smaller than three, for example, right? So that's pretty easy to use. As you see here, that was also the main goal of the demo to show. And then um, in the end, it's, I can also destroy all my stuff again. So that's pretty nice also if you have never seen Confluent command line interface before. So let me just exit here. Um, and then I just say Confluent Destroy, and then it shuts it down again. So when I do a demo tomorrow somewhere else, I can start from the beginning. Or if you crash something while doing development, you can start from the beginning again. So um, that's really pretty nice, um, but it's only used for local development. So um, this was my live demo. So I hope you got a little bit of feeling about um, what KSQL is and how that looks like. And I hope with all the use cases I explained, you see that it's many, many different use cases um, which you can use it for, very simple ones, very technical ones, and also more powerful ones. 
If you want to get started by yourself, um, KSQL is fully open source, it's on GitHub. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, several different options how you get started. The first thing I really recommend is the quick start guide on our website or on the, on the KSQL GitHub website. Um, here you either have the option like me, I just ran it locally on my laptop or you run it in Docker containers. And with that, um, it goes through, through similar steps which I just showed you so that you can understand the basic concepts of that. And after that, I'm sure you can already start using KSQL with your own Kafka topics and Kafka cluster. Um, after you have that, done that, if you want to understand more and want to take a look at our examples, we have a pretty cool clickstream analysis where we also use Kafka Connect to integrate data. And then as sync, we use Elasticsearch and Grafana. And here you see different examples of how you can build a dashboard on top of that. And the funny thing is not just um, running this, because it's really, this is just one Docker command. You can get it running in five minutes if you have Docker installed. And then it's running. And the important thing here is you cannot just take a look at the examples here in the dashboard but you can then also take a look at the SQL queries under the hood which are running. So you can understand what is going on and you can adjust it and play around with that. In addition to that, um, we also have KSQL Recipes. That's also pretty cool. That's an initiative which just started uh, two, months or so, uh, or go, uh, two months ago or so. So this will be um, much more in the future, but this is the idea to show you simple snippets of different things, what you can do. For example, conversion from JSON to Afro, or some specific um, industry-specific use cases like sensor analytics, how to integrate syslog data with KSQL and process it. So this is the beginning just now. Um, we are also happy to get PRs from people but also we ourselves have built many more examples here. So with that, um, if you want to try it out, get to the GitHub page. It's fully open source. Um, we are also happy to help you on our um, Confluent community Slack, where many people are, um, people are other end users. That's not just for KSQL, but for all the Kafka components. And also our engineers and so on are there. So for even for technical questions and, and feature requirements, they are happy to hear that. So with that, that's in the end also my summary. So KSQL is the streaming SQL engine for Kafka. Um, it's really many, many use cases. You can do it for repartitioning and very technical things. You can do it for stateless continuous processing, like filtering or transformations of single events before you send it to the next one. Or you can do stateful aggregations. And as you have seen with the UDF example for machine learning, you can in the end build anything and very powerful things and deploy them to production. It's GA and ready already for production, even for large scale with really m millions of messages. And with that, I'm done. So I see we have four minutes left. So maybe there are also some questions. There is one. I'm not sure. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. So. Hello. Um, you have been talking about the if there are any problems with the server, the replication. But if KSQL is make a transform, what ha if all my cluster is down, what happened? Is it like his own offset or something similar? So um, the question is also if Kafka brokers is down? Or, or uh, all my cluster is down, so mm -hmm. my KSQL is mm -hmm. make a yeah. Is doing something yep. with the data, what happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the same like with any Kafka application. So it's like offsets, as you said, and so on. So you will not lose any data. Even if you have a KSQL cluster with three um, KSQL servers, if all are down, um, it knows where to start again. That's the same concepts like from Kafka consumers. It starts from the offset where it stops. So that's the same uh, reliability you have with, with Kafka in general. Okay, then thanks a lot, and come to me if you have more questions, and th or there's one more. Hi, thank you. Hey. Uh, two questions. Um, first of all, uh, can you do with uh, the new KSQL all the operations you could do with the basic API? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, I understand you can deploy, as you said, that in, in Docker or Kubernetes as a consumer mm -hmm. application, mm -hmm. but the server side, I think Confluent is making effort into putting also the server in, in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Is that already in place or, mm -hmm. or not yet? So for the first question about the APIs, so um, KSQL does not offer 100% of the API of Kafka Streams. Um, but we are pretty good there, and the main goal is in the end to support everything, but there is some limitation. So for example, interactive queries of Kafka Streams are not included in, Kaf in KSQL yet. So it's not 100%, it's this 80-20 rule again, but which is actually a good fit because KSQL is not meant for every use case, so it's still okay, but we want to improve it. But it's 
not, not fully complete as Kafka Streams yet. And for the deployment part, um, first of all, you are right. Um, we are seeing trends a lot regarding Kubernetes and containers and so on. So we are also working on that. Um, that's actually also more or less in place for us internally. So um, we also have um, Confluent as a service, Confluent Cloud, where we host everything for you so that you don't have to manage Kafka, you just use it. Um, we provide that with SLAs like 99.95 availability and latency and throughput guarantees. And um, what we have already in beta and which is coming out soon also for the customers is that we host KSQL with that. And that's in the end under the hood running also as Docker containers and Kubernetes because our cloud infrastructure runs on Kubernetes. And the same is then true for KSQL also. So it's already there. We know how to do that. But we also help our customers doing that in their environments if you want. But it's already working and we have the best practice best practices internally to help you getting it running also. And that's also possible for production. Thank you. So if you have any more questions, uh, you can go mm -hmm. later to ask, ask the expert. And an important thing, uh, if you have found like a wallet, uh, please take it to the stand of uh, booth 23. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks for coming, guys.